Hello Namibia and welcome to your daily lunchtime show where we get to catch up on current events and headlines that are in the news. My name is Priska Agnolo and you are watching NMH at One. So let us first have a look at the incoming news this morning. Michael Capere has passed away. President Hage Genkop announced with great sadness this morning that Mandela Capere has passed away. The president wrote in a message, Our nation has lost a dynamic parliamentarian who played an important role in shaping the trajectory of youth leadership in our land. Sincere condolences to the entire family. Capere recently showed strong character and will when he opposed Martin Charlie's infamous hate speech against political opponents. At the time, he said that the remarks by former chief of the Namibian Defense Force, Martin Charlie, in which he called for the slitting of throats of Swapo defectors, were unfortunate and indefensible. May his soul rest in peace. And now we move on to our COVID-19 update. The latest COVID-19 figures for Namibia as at Saturday, the 5th of December, was announced yesterday. Namibia has now tested more than 150,000 people and surpassed 15,000 positive cases. 9.8 of those tested were positive. Increased cases in certain health districts resulted in more tests being done, a daily average of more than 1,100 by Thursday, and the recovery rate falling back to 92%. Vintuk is now recording the highest daily average of new cases in eight weeks, and the capital city's total number of cases will, according to the current trend, reach the 7,000 mark within days. Total cases in the Karas region increased beyond 700. The three main drivers of the current upsurge is Vintuk, with a daily average of 84 new cases over the three days ended on Saturday, Amaruru with an average of 22, and Luderitz with an average of 17. Smaller upsurges are being recorded in the districts of Oshwarongo with an average of six cases per day, Sokobund with six, Valfus Bay five, and Karasberg with four. Let us all heed authorities' calls to follow hygiene regulations. Keep your social distancing and wear masks. Now is not the time to let our guard down. <music> As always, next we bring you video news clips from around the country. Today we only have two clips, but they do remain interesting. For our first video, Esther Kamati records people of Stand of Cheetah Conservation Fund. On Friday, the Cheetah Conservation Fund had a pop-up information booth in celebration of International Cheetah Day. Moni Grunefeld and Amanda Engelbrecht, two interns of the CCF, share their thoughts and tell us what the CCF does. Do have a look. We are here today because today is International Cheetah Day. Uh, we are here to create awareness in Australia. A lot of the cheetahs is good. Namibia has the largest population of cheetahs in the world. So we're trying to help, we're trying to work with communities, we're trying to work with people, especially farmers, to live alongside our cheetahs because we want to conserve them. We want to have cheetahs for the next year when this is coming. <laughs> All right, right. Um, so some of the work that we do um, at the Cheetah Conservation Fund um, includes research, education, and conservation. Um, 
we do a lot of things. We not only educate the farmers, but we go out to schools. We um, try to engage with the public on days such as this one, um, just to basically educate them about you know, the importance of cheetahs, why we need them around, and why it's so important to conserve them. Um, so that's just some of the work that we do at the Cheetah Conservation Center. Yes. And with regard to what I said earlier about uh, most especially focusing on farmers, the reason being that we have a lot of wildlife conflict happening with the farmers, um, especially with the cheetahs. Most of the kills taking place on farms, um, well, the farmers think that it's the cheetahs. So what we do is we try to educate the farmers with um, outreach programs, and we also have a livestock guarding dog program running at CCF right now, whereby we um, give farmers. Um, livestock guarding dogs and Anatolian free um, to help mitigate the, the cheetah killing that's happened. So that's a little bit of what we do. We also have other programs. We have a scat program also running where we um, collect cheetah, leopard, more predator scat. We have our own genetics lab. So we um, try to see like the DNA of the cheetahs. Um, yeah, we have a lot going on in the conservation fund. We try to work with as many people as we can. For our second video, Steffi Balsar speaks to Varishka Dumeni of Fridays for Future. Steffi Balsar speaks to Berushka Dumeni of Vintux branch of Fridays for Future during the protest march against the planned prospecting for oil and gas in the Kavango regions held last Friday. Hailing from Texas, the American company Recon Africa intends to jointly with the Ministry of Mining and Energy to literally drill hundreds of boreholes and apparently make use of the infamous system of fracking to extract oil in an ecologically highly sensitive area of Namibia and also in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. The Delta is a World Heritage Site. and we are part of Fridays for Future Winduk. Uh, we are here to demonstrate against the oil drilling in the Kavango by the Canadian company Recon Africa. Um, we believe that there should not be drilling of any oil in any nation, especially a sensitive area as uh, the Okavango, that may affect the Okavango Delta, which supplies uh, the livelihoods of, of uh, over 200,000 people from the three countries. Um, we are marching to the UNR House because we've seen that the UN House is committed to um, achieving and um, is committed to achieving the SDGs. And this company, as well as the government, who is enabling this uh, this project, is actually breaking and hindering um, five of those SDGs. We stand here today as a coalition of concerned Namibians, concerned youth, safeguarding our future, preventing even more interest of fossil fuel ecocidal giants in Namibia, which shale is discovered. The Canadian and US company Recon Africa has put, uh, snuck past our doors. They brought with them potential environmental destruction to our pristine ecosystems in the government. They have come to exercise their addiction to fossil fuels. We plans to scout and drill for oil and gas in our land. We say keep the oil in the ground. Oil and gas exploration will hinder the local, local conservation efforts, climate change adaptation efforts, as well as climate mitigation efforts. The exploration license extends across the home territory of the sand people of the First Nation of Namibia and Botswana. They were ghosted throughout the whole process. We are here to amplify their voices. Namibia was the first country to include environmental protections in the Constitution. All three nations, Namibia, Botswana and Canada, are among the 196 nations that have signed the Paris Agreement. With this signature, the respective governments agreed to sustainably reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to limit the warming below 2 degrees Celsius in this century. Namibia also draws financial resources from the Green Climate Fund. As you said, the uh, part of the Kavango is uh, the World Heritage Site. Uh, therefore, they are under the, the Convention. So what uh, we can say as you UN is that already both countries are uh, engaging a sovereign country with the Secretariat of the Convention in order just to look at this, uh, at this matter. So far, this is the information I can also say with you. 
Thank you. I will really motivate you just to continue also to express your concern. Today we're looking at the front pages of various Namibian papers today. And we see that in the Algemeine Zeitung, that it leads with a recent increase in the, in the number of COVID-19 cases. While Namibia does not automatically strike a problem in terms of having reached the internationally recognized red line of 50 infections per 100,000 inhabitants over a seven-day period, it does remain worrisome that some people seem to disregard all COVID-19 regulations designed to keep all of us safe. A month ago, Namibia still recorded 13 COVID-19 cases per 100,000 people over seven days. Now we stand at 26. That could be the result of disregarding behavior dating back to the elections and election campaigns, but we should get this back under control before our tourism sector and for that matter, our economy experience, experiences another serious blow. The AZ also covers the protest march against oil fracking in the Kavango regions. Republican has an interesting lead story on their page one. Namibia is currently staring some serious shortages in the face since South Africa introduced a curfew at their border points last week. That has caused a serious backlog in trucks that are cleared by customs each day, resulting in shortages even on the pharmaceutical front. The problem has become bigger on account of truck drivers preferring the longer route through the Northern Cape instead of passing through Botswana, as the COVID-19 results of tests performed in Botswana take too long before they are released. This places a risk on the logistical chain and effectiveness. The Namibian Sun leads with a further downgrade of Namibia's creditworthiness by Moody's. Moody's has downgraded our economy from junk status BA2 to junk status BA3. The Minister of Finance, Ipumbu Shimi, reckons that COVID-19 has reversed five years gains of fiscal consolidation. Government seems to prefer to heap all blame on the coronavirus, totally disregarding corruption scandals such as fish rot, which will certainly have added to the problem. Fact is that Moody's blames the inflated government wage bill, as well as the existing budget deficit, growing debt burden, and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Namibian leads with a 10 billion Namibian dollar deal that the Environmental Investment Fund has struck with South Africa's Growth Catalyst Fund of Vuyo Jack. These sort of deals are immediately gauged against the fish rot scandal when it turns out that Vuyo Jack is one of the persons invited by President Hage Genkop to be part of the high-level panel on economy. So it does not surprise when the Namibian comes to the conclusion that the state-owned environment fund has over the years emerged as a cash cow for the political elite. Sadly, government seems to fail to understand that you cannot, as advisor, be part of the investment solution without people identifying a lack of transparency and accountability, especially if the public is not properly and openly briefed and informed. New Era takes on a very serious issue on its page one under the heading Namibia's child rape epidemic. This is truly a worrying development. We had everybody in arms over Shannon Basafal, a case that turned out to be less of a gender-based violence case than expected. Yet we seem to make peace with the fact that since then, multiple children and young women have been raped and murdered. Now New Era focuses on a 67-year-old grandfather who repeatedly raped his 13-year-old granddaughter and a 44-year-old father who has raped his 5-year-old daughter on a number of occasions. This is truly sickening to say the least. And on the inside of our country's newspapers, you'll be able to read up on the following. On its page two, the Algemeine Zeitung focuses on biomass production, which increasingly offers farmers and also communal organizations to earn an alternative income.
With the support of the BCBU project, the Namibian University of Science and Technology, NAST, can now expand its laboratory capacities in the field of research and analysis of bush biomass. Meanwhile, the direct export of Namibian biomass to Hamburg is being discussed in Germany. The Republican newspaper on its page 2 gives full insight into the planned fracking for oil in the Kavango regions. There is a public and international outcry against the Texan mining business Recon Africa that has previously boasted that it can access millions of barrels of oil if it was allowed to drill hundreds of boreholes. In the meantime, the Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism, Pahamba Shifeta, seems to support this endeavor. On its page 3, the Namibian Sun reports about the High Court decision that put aside the charges of money laundering by Michael Amushilelo and his business partner Gregory Kluta. These two had received more than 17 million Namibian dollars from the public for investment purposes. This charge is, however, only one of a number of charges laid by the Bank of Namibia. The Namibian reports on its page 3 that the youth is putting pressure on the newly elected mayor of Vintuk, Job Amupanda. They would like to see him walk the talk after he was known for insisting that the city of Vintuk finds faster solutions when it comes to making housing available to the masses. People want him to come up with a solution now and they also want him to repeal the squatter proclamation which allows the city to remove and demolish illegal shacks. The cabinet went on a retreat last week and the New Era reports on its page 3 that the vice president Nangolo Mumba made it clear that he would like to see a results driven culture in future. Bumba reckons that Namibia is good at planning but now needs to become good at executing such plans. That is it on our forefront of newspaper articles. Let's go for a quick ad break and we'll be right back to introduce the interview section for today. Kenya Kamboi has interviewed the Rundu Urban Community Association representative on the Rundu Town Council, Nicholas Ndumba. They spoke about what the, agent, what the agenda on the local authority will be. Let us listen to the recording. Uh, Mr. Ndumba, uh, as a newly elected uh, representative of Ruka Minutes. on the Rundu Town Council, can you just briefly tell us what are the plans? What is the way forward now? You are into council now. What is the plan forward? Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to just give honor and also to acknowledge that uh, the residents of Rungu have seen the value of giving a chance to Ruka to try and to change this town. And uh, as we said that one already earlier, earlier in our manifesto is that we, we are go there is a number of things that we are going to look at. And the first thing that what we want to do in the office is to have those re resolution on the, the table. Checking on this resolution to see which resolution at this point of time is fit to our people. Mm -hmm. And those resolutions that was passed that we see that is unconstitutional and it's illegal, we are going to revoke them and set them aside because we are, cannot operate on things that actually that is disadvantaging our people. In terms of, in terms of our office belief is that this office represent uh, the, the community of Rundu. The first thing that we want to look at as Ruka is now in the office is to look at the, the revenue collections. Where does actually, where do we get money? To sustain this town but i believe uh rural town council all these last past years has been relying much on on water 
water and, and which means water is basic need so we cannot punish our residents if they did not pay the water then the, the water have to be cut off and whatever reason to use it as punishment or to collect revenue and water is not the only means of, of collecting revenues there is a lot of avenues that we can look at uh, of, of, of collecting avenues one we can look at is social responsibilities uh, by these corporate companies and so forth there is a lot of uh, unserviced land uh, vision lands not found in Rundu. We don't know whether those those lands belongs to who. So those are we need to audit also. Uh, th those lands should be audited to see whether the owners of those those plots are paying right and taxes or not. So those are other areas that we should look at and say if we can collect money from there. There is big big uh, business here in this town. They complete. They do nothing. One of them I can mention is that uh, Shoprite, OKs, and so forth. And many Burman grow. They, they completely completely com uh, they. Com uh, contribute nothing completely to the development of this town. So all what they do here is that they suck money from our residents. So what we say is that every person that is running business in Rondo should be able to contribute uh, to the well-being of our residents. And, uh, and, 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 and the report that we expect uh, to be completed by the management, by the chairperson that we are going to put to task, the chairperson of the management committee should be able to produce all the reports, previous report and current report, to, to say as to what is exactly what is the town going through at this point of time and all their resolutions all we have to look at all uh, financial financial report for previous years even the current one and also we need to know and there is a rumor that sometimes they used to take money back to the treasure so all these things that we want to know to see what exactly happening in our town and also we are very much disappointed the time when they used to cut water in Rundu town so they concentrate on the area uh, where people, poor people live, and that is especially Kemus, Ndamas, Twingereni, and so forth, and Tumwenenu, uh, so Twingereni, Kaisos, and so forth. Those are the areas where they are concentrating, cutting the water. But Queen's Park and this other uh, suburb, they don't, doesn't cut waters, and because they believe that those guys, uh, they are so powerful, they might take them to court, and then they are efforted. So then they result to, 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 to relinquish their lust, and actually they, they result on, on punishing the poor people. And that's not what we're going to tolerate at this point of time. The first thing that we want to do is first to first to check the account of all the politicians that lives in Rundu. All the politicians, all the people that are serving on the higher government rank officials, and we are going to check their water bills. If we find that they also owe the council like any other person does, so those are the people that we need to cut first. Because the poor people actually should be left to be the last people. But actually the revenue, if matter of collecting revenue, so the revenue shouldn't be targeted to those people that are employed. So actually that's uh, what we are looking at. And uh, now when we look to roads, roads has been really, has been standing since the inception, since the begin since uh, the independence of this country, there was nothing done in terms of the road here in Rundu. Now the question is, what exactly happened? Where did the money went? Did, they, did we not get money from the central government, from the regional council? We not, did we not receive any budget regarding the road? All money was received and was it misused, misused? So those are things that we want to look at and said, road should be one of the things that we have to look at as a priority. So we need roads and actually we need also a proper land that we should survey and to give it to our people. Because the problem of Rundu is that since independence, Town Council did not service any piece of land apart from the land, the one that was serviced by uh, Lux Development. When Lux Development left, so Town Council just fold their arms, sit and relax. So it did not service any single land. Where do you find a town in Namibia that never serviced a land since the beginning of uh, independence until today? That is the only, the only town that can only be Rundu. And Rundu is cursed. The people that has been in leadership, actually all of them, they were cursed. Because on top of that, no service since independence until to down, no compensation was done to the people that, you know, when the town was demarcated. So there was no compensation taking place. And then Rundu is the only town in the whole country that never compensated its residents. What insult is that? So we are, we are saying that the compensation policy should, we have to go into negotiation. The people that was moved, the people who lost their lands, the people who lost their uh, customer lands should be compensated. And we are going to renegotiate with the government. Of course, I know the budget is there. So those are things that we want to, to look at, actually, that's what we want to enforce. Otherwise, by short, that's actually the whole idea of Ruka. Okay, thank, thank you very much, much. Mr. Ndumbo, for your time. Thank, thank you very much. Okay.
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of today's lunchtime show. We look forward towards engaging with you again tomorrow. And thank you so much for watching and supporting us here on Anime Chat 1. Please do join us again at the same time and at the same place tomorrow. Until then, be safe and stay healthy. And don't forget to stay for a quick snapshot of the weather as well. Goodbye, Namibia.